Yeah, so my name is Sonia, and I only have one shirt. <laughs> Furthermore, I gave this talk before, and which uh, you know makes this kind of similar to a keynote from Apple, I think. Um, only that I'm presenting an improved version of my previous talk. And um, it's an improved version because uh, the wonderful people behind the conference where I gave this talk before, it's Joy of Coding, they um, sent me feedback afterwards. And generally, I respond well to feedback. So one could say it was mixed, so there's a 10 in there, there's a 1 in there. Uh, someone said it was a major surprise, I think that's a positive thing. Quirky, generic, and then chaotic. That's fair, you know. Life itself is kind of chaotic. Right now, un I'm unemployed. Um, soon, I won't have a place to stay. Again. <laughs> um, and all the 95% matches on OkCupid, I've been friends with before I even set up my profile. So, no wonder my talks resemble chaos in a way, but it'll, it'll be fine, right? Because I'm still doing well in regards of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and um, maybe you've heard of it. It's, um, it's a theory proposed in psychology, um, a theory of human motivation, and it describes the stages that we generally move through when we develop our personality and mind. So the requirements of every stage need to be met in order to move on to the next stage. And um, by default, um, you know, I don't have to worry about finding food. I have a safe place to sleep. Um, love needs, let's assume I figure that out too. So there's only one thing left to do, and that's the constantly recurring critical reflection of my own life and happiness. And on that note, I would like to um, share a moment with you that's still quite vivid in my memory. Um, and I'll play some background music for this, hopefully. And it was in November 2014, a Saturday evening, and um, 10 p.m. or something, and I'm sitting on my couch, um, sipping some sort of liquor, um, listening to a recording of the singing comet. I don't have sound, I think, but... while also doing some JavaScript exercises on Codecademy, right? And you know, I consciously paused for a minute, because it's like, this is rather strange. Why is there sound in space? <laughs> but also, this is the comet. <laughs> so, but also, why am I at home on a Saturday night, writing infinite loops, crashing my browser, you know, this is Berlin. Shouldn't I be at the Kit Kat Club throwing biodegradable glitter at people I just met on Tinder? Possibly. But today's quest is to understand the motivation and reason behind recurring late-night hobby-oriented programming activities. So, when it comes to code, I consider myself an amateur. And I'd, li I'd like to know, if, does any one of you consider himself an amateur? One, two, couple? Okay, that's cool. And. Um, Oh yeah, um, my background is in graphics design, so I kind of had to put in a lens flare here. Um, so an amateur is generally considered a per well, um, it's generally considered a person um, who loves writing code, right? So that's the, the basic definition of it. And um, it's not attached to you know, it's attached to a particular pursuit, study, or science, and in a non-professional or unpaid manner. And uh, we are often self-taught without any formal training, or little of that. So the definition shines a quite, you know, surprising, surprisingly nice light on the term, because amateur is usually connotated with, like, negative um, associations. It's described, it describes someone with low capabilities, you know, no particular depth of skill. So, for that reason, it makes sense to place the term expert on the opposite end of the universe. And an expert is a person with extensive knowledge um, or ability in a particular area of study. They are commonly recognized as a reliable source of a technique or skill, and their ability is based on a long-term, intense experience through like, research, practice, or occupation. And both terms suggest particular assumptions about a person's level of skill, which only leaves the question if experts enjoy what they do too. 
So what joy as emotions are chaotic, so let's put them aside for a moment, maybe in the quiet room. And uh, while we take a look at the general process of skill acquisition, and um, sucking at something is the first step of becoming sort of good at something. And I fairly often run into things that I'm really bad at. Um, Felix keynote, for example, yesterday. You know, I, I admit I didn't understand a thing, but uh, one day I will. And these talks are like poetry to me. Um, they're beautiful. <laughs> so recently I found out I'm particularly bad at aqua piloxing, which is um, it's a mix of Pilates and boxing in the water with a pool noodle. And um, the story here is that one winter I was just, yeah, was, um, I didn't want to pay money to enter the gym. So instead I searched for every free taster training session that I could find in the city. Um, and I actually wish there was an app for that, so if anybody wants to build that. And it, it worked out quite well. But in the end, I didn't stick with any of these sports. And I believe it's rather unlikely to pick up a hobby just out of the blue. So there needs to be a trigger, you know, something that switches on your curiosity, your competitive spirit, or maybe some good old Gruppenzwang, which is peer pressure. And in my case, it was my friend Daniel telling me to go to a rail skills workshop. And uh, there's a galaxy of similar initiatives um, directed at various groups of humans. All of them are fantastic. And in fact, today sees the first rust bridge, which I'm very excited about. And um, from my experience, these events establish a perfect environment to become an amateur. Because you're joining a crowd of fellow learners and coaches, and it pushes you through that initial period of frustration that you might uh, encounter. And then you reach a point where further learning is uh, possible as a solo activity. And I'm feeling especially lucky because my friend Daniel, he not, uh, not only recommended to go to the workshop, but he was sitting down with me one-on-one, -on -one and he t like, told me how to code. Um, and I'm forever grateful for this, for his time and help, and I just wanted to have that on record. Um, he was there when I typed my first, second, and third command into the terminal. He was there when I realized he just tricked me into renaming my local host. Um, he explained Chrome's developer tools to me and um, supervised my initial attempts of writing JavaScript without copy and pasting stuff. So I had to come up for a project for our sessions, and um, what do you know, we built my first online business. Aviology. It's your horoscope based on aircraft, not star constellations, disrupting the future of fortune telling. <laughs> Who saw that coming, right? Um, so, what it does, it gets your location and it finds the closest airport, and that's basically all our team uh, needs to generate a personal air sign. So, right now it's free. But anyway, um, so right on, I figured code, right? It en enables me to bring my ideas to life. When do I quit my job and pursue this you know, newfound passion full time? At what point is this path an official career? Um, am I sort of good at it? Uh, more importantly, how do I know? And the answer, like all answers, is in the book. Not that the book, but the book, which probably needs some explaining, but um, I'll do that by looking at the game Checkers. Checkers is a two-player board game. Um, each player starts with 12 pieces on his or her side, and pieces can only be moved di diagonally forward. So a player tries to take the opponent's pieces out of the game by jumping over them, and then the first player to re remove all the opponent's pieces wins. So far, so good. So I love this image, by the way, because did you see the floor? It has a checkers pattern, too. Anyway, so um, in 1863, um, sorry, one thing. So the game is an extreme example of a regular environment, which is uh, a basic condition for sustainable skill acquisition. Um, so now professional checkers players, uh, they improve their game by studying the moves that other players has ma have made in the past. Um, they write them down and add them into their memory. So in 1863, uh, checkers reached its peak. Um, it's the championship between James Wiley and Robert Martins, two notorious players facing off in an intense series of 40 games. All 40 end in a draw. All 40 start with the same three to four moves. 21 of them are the exact duplicate of each other from start to finish. So now this situation is only possible because both players were experts. 
with equal skills in the craft. You know, they knew the game inside out and probably themselves like each other too. So both were playing by the book. So doing something by the book basically means to not only strictly follow the rules, but also to apply perfect technique. And it's a predefined logical way to complete a task. So what if, you know, was, you know, if someone was writing code by the book? That must be a reliable indication of an advanced level of skill. Only that writing code is not like checkers. Um, it's more like you know, chess, maybe, because there's no finite boundary to the practice. You know, it's an ever-expanding universe. Chess is also an example of a regular environment, but the number of possible chess games is appro approximately 10 to the bottom of 120, and that's far more than the number of atoms in the universe. So nowadays, more modern chess players also have um, an extensive, constantly growing you know, library of recorded moves at their disposal, which they use to study as well. So even in chess, there are whole sequences in a game that are played from memory, and not from thought. But um, in every game of chess, there's a moment that puts the book in its place. You have a constellation that has never occurred in the universe before. Um, both players are on their own. It's a zero moment. The novelty, um, it's a situation that is out of book. So when you get to that moment, you feel you are alive. And this might be the right moment to chat about emotions. You know, remember joy, happiness, and fun over there. Um, so maybe let's start with an exercise. So one way how humans empathize with other humans is by mimicking their facial expressions. So in theory, when I smile, I should see some of you smiling back at me. You know? Otherwise, it would be frightening. Um, maybe it works better if you smile at each other. <laughs> <Not sure. laughs> and that made it awkward. And then <laughs> so now by smiling, you can uh, also trick yourself into feeling better. Um, because the muscles in your face basically tell your brain it's heavy time. Um, that's a crude ver version of the process, but that's basically how it works. Now, it doesn't solve any problems, and it barely is the key to happiness, but uh, what is that anyway? Um, and I'm glad to present to you today the ultimate definition of happiness, um, which I found in a video by Alexander Game, and it's uh, absolutely gorgeous, so I'm going to show you a minute of it. Um, so just to set the scene, it's day 86 of Alexander's full return, solo full return from the South Pole, and he's about to pick up the last cash, cash that he left behind on him on his expedition, and he, he has no clue what he left behind and doesn't expect very much. Oh, Jeg tror ikke det er noe, men det er alltid lov å håpe. Vi stikker enda mer vaseline, og det er for så vidt ikke bruk for. Sinksalve, vi kaller det laia. Det er ganske mye her, så det er tydeligvis bra. Ja! Ja! It goes on for a little bit longer, so you find some other interesting things, but uh, I just want to clarify that cheese duels are probably not the secret to a happy life and all, um, but maybe that you know, needs some further investigation. And speaking of investigations, you know, sometimes maybe when I get bored I, uh, or I have a talk to prepare, I go on Twitter, and it's fascinating to see the hobbies that software developers get into when they are not working, uh, writing code at work. The craft of crochet, baking bread, Japanese archery, 
making soap. Cats, of course. But the greatest hobby of all times, the activity that most software developers get into when not writing code at work, is writing code at home. <laughs> On the weekends. Um, Ryan, for example. <laughs> Uh, from Ryan, I learned uh, that, um, you know, that he wrote a Chip 8 emulator in Rust. And from him, I learned that Chip 8 is a virtual machine and programming language which was used in the late 70s um, on some computers such as the Telmec, um, mostly as a basic gaming platform. And now there's a Chip 8 Rust emulator for the game Pong, which is pretty awesome. And what everyone with a hobby has in common is that they take up extra work for themselves. And I learned from Jane McGonigal, more precisely from her book, Reality is Broken, that there is almost nothing that makes us happier than good hard work that we choose for ourselves. And that's a precise definition of how a game works. And ready or not, I have some, uh, some more game theory for you. So when you look at any game, um, it's usually a combination of four core ingredients. First, uh, there's the goal. It sets the mission and purpose of the activity you're about to engage in. Um, secondly, there's rules. They tell you what's allowed and what isn't, and you know, some people see that as an opportunity to break them. A feedback system is essential to tell players how close they are to achieving these goals and uh, that they are within their capabilities. And lastly, it's voluntary particip participation. Um, which basically means uh, making sure that everyone involved in the game agrees to the goal, the rules, and the feedback system. So Alexander, you know, he was playing the game Return from the South Pole. If you look at, it, at his exhibition in that way, you know, uh, the goal was to come back alive, and the rules were mostly set by the landscape and the weather. So every cache he picked up was a sort of a feedback system, and I'm pretty sure he did it on his own device. Um, so his outburst of extreme happiness is the result of the game, or in other words, the unnecessary obstacle that he set for himself. So in a less thrilling scenario, I'm, on, I'm sitting on my couch on a Saturday night and I'm playing to code. And then everything changed. You know, last November I started my first job as a front-end developer. Um, from one moment to the other, my previous hobby-oriented approach turned into a profession. And writing code became sort of a serious business. It paid the bills. And um, I had to stop playing and put my unverified knowledge to the test. As we all know, that didn't last. Um, what still lasts is the experience of programming in a professional environment. And you know, my learning curve just went straight through the roof. Um, there's no better setup for a junior than to pair program with a seasoned colleague. Um, so my programming partner actually said he has never talked that much in his life. Um, I also had clearly defined learning goals and accordingly the prospect to reach another level of skill. And this gave me an essential feeling of mastery. Furthermore, I became a part of something bigger. So accomplishing things together, um, sharing knowledge and making social connections, you know, it's satisfying and it gives me an essential feeling of purpose. It's uh, two very powerful concepts, mastery and purpose. They provide an understanding for, uh, you know, kind of fascinating stories behind open source projects. From the perspective of conventional economics, you know, these undertakings are disastrous, I think. I mean, how would, you, how would one justify spending 20 to 30 hours a week producing sophisticated technological work without any form of reimbursement? And, uh, Furthermore, after weeks and weeks of dedicated work, you know, the final product is released for free. That's kind of how the Linux kernel came to be. To 12,000 programmers who volunteered their time, Linux was a chance to um, be part of something bigger, you know, than themselves, and to connect their individual uh, contribution to a collective outcome. And being parts that unfold on such great scales, you know, it's an experience of curiosity, awe, and wonder. Where does it leave us? Should we go to an aqua piloxing class? Contribute to open source projects? Get a cat? Probably all of the above. But all I know um, is that whatever you get up to, and there's one skill that I hope you try to practice vigorously, 
and that's the skill of allowing yourself to play and potentially against yourself. And actually, before I wrap up rather soon, um, I'd like to confess I haven't touched much code in the last two months, which does not mean I didn't build anything, but it was more related to rusty nails and wooden bridges in a forest. And um, see that excitement on my face? That's how I feel about today and actually about the upcoming Rust Bridge workshop. So, unless there's any questions, I would say go play.